Hello, tech fans, and welcome into the latest edition of the Tech Sideline podcast, originating from TSL's high tech studios in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Whether you are watching or listening, so glad you could join us today on November 13th as we preview Virginia Tech and Georgia Tech that takes place this Saturday with a 3.30 kick in Atlanta. We've got our normal crew today on the Tech Sideline podcast. We've got Malcolm Stewart behind the scenes producing on the podcast set, our managing editor, Chris Coleman, our founder and head honcho, Will Stewart, and I'm your podcast host, Evan Hughes. Again, so glad that everybody could join us as we record on Wednesday morning, November the 13th, and get you set for Georgia Tech and Virginia Tech. This week and every week, the Tech Sideline podcast is presented by the Fisher Law Firm, Virginia's trusted DUI and traffic defense firm, dedicated to defending individuals charged with traffic-related offenses. From their offices in Blacksburg and Roanoke, the Fisher Law Firm handles cases throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. To date, the firm has defended more than 30,000 people charged with moving violations. For free consultation, call anytime, day or evening, toll free at 1-800-680-7031. That number one more time, 1-800-680-7031, or email them at info at fisherlegal.com. Guys, good morning to you. Uh, It is extremely cold outside in Blacksburg. (laughs) For those that were here this weekend and experienced a 60-degree day on Sunday, oh, how the tables have turned since. That's bearable for me because the wind's not blowing at all. I'm perfectly okay with it. It was was last night. I was about to say, yesterday it was blowing. I thought the wind was going to be blowing, uh, and it was when I went to the store last night, but then it settled down, and it's fine. So I'm good with it. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, it was really weird because I was was sitting there at the mat on the mound, and and I was in the sun early on in the uh, meet. Mm -hmm. And and I I was hot. And here it is three days later, and it's in the teens. So that's Blacksburg for you. I, I the whole I have about a ten minute drive from my house to uh, the high tech studios here, and my steering wheel was freezing the whole way here. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm, I'd I'm, never experienced that. I'm before. sorry, I got distracted. You said high tech. <laughs> <laughs> it is high tech studios, 100. percent And speaking of the high tech studios, no, I meant that we have high tech, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like Virginia, Virginia. Yeah. So that you. that leads to me thinking maybe we need to put some different pictures up on the television. Or our, I think our mostly male audience are probably like that. Anyway, I'm sorry to derail you. Go ahead. No, no. Well, it kind of leads well. The high tech studio that we have here inside the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Some new additions this yes. week. So yes, with, we have uh, I'll, some. I'll turn that over to you, Will. Okay, so we have some set updates. Uh, our good friend Clark Ruland. Most of you know him as Clark Ruland. Hokey twenty. On <laughs> Hokey twenty on Twitter. <laughs> he puts his real name out there. So, Clark, let's see. Clark brought us the, uh, what is that? It's the Ryan Blaney Mm -hmm. Wood Brothers uh, car. Very cool back there. Uh, What else did we do? Oh, he also, over on the gnome cam, you got the gnome cam going, Malcolm? Yeah, so you see that. That's, uh, he brought me a face mask and some beads from New Orleans. And, of course, everybody at the table said, how'd you get those beads, Clark? Um, And let's see. So, those are cool things that Clark brought us. He also brought, let's see, he brought a... uh, Brought a an actual Independence Bowl patch from 1993. I don't have that up here anywhere. Uh, but over my shoulder, we've got um, – yeah, there you go. Ah, nice. Malcolm on the spot. That, that's a nice catch. Man. That was a nice I, catch. I have terrible hands. Well that done. was a really nice catch. We'll put you catch. on scholarship, Will. Yeah, so here's the uh, – it's very nice. So anyway, Poland, Poulan. We, we used to pronounce it Poulan back then. Poulan Weed Eater Independence Bowl. Um, so appreciate that, Clark. And over my shoulder here, we've got a uh, picture of me and Frank. I'm decked out in uh, full Virginia Tech uniform. Awesome. That, was, that was right before Frank cut him after he tried to walk on. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I think I made reference on the podcast before when I put it when I put an actual football helmet on my head. It looks like an orange on a toothpick. It's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, but there's a story there. That was Frank Beaver's fantasy cap in two, back in 2004, and we can talk about that some other time. But part of the uh, weekend camp was they put us in full gear. So, very cool. And I've got one of the infamous Go Hoakies cups. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. So, I don't know what year. Maybe maybe some of the uh, more mature individuals on uh, Facebook uh, Live can tell us. I don't know what year that cup came out. But uh, I won't pick the cup up and turn it around or anything. But it's it's when Virginia Tech was making the transition from fighting gobblers to Hokies. And I think that was a Bill, uh, I'm blanking, 
football coach. Bill Dooley? Bill, Bill Dooley, Dooley, thank you. That was a Bill Dooley thing. He was also athletic director, and I think he started in 77 as head football coach and athletic director. And that's how Tech got him away from North Carolina. They offered him the AD job in addition to being the uh, football coach. And I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm not up on this part of my Tech history, but I'm pretty sure it was Dooley that said, we're switching from fighting gobblers to Hokies. So the transition at times was rough, as you can imagine. He, I think it was he who took the 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 gobbler down off the scoreboard. I believe that every time Tech scored, they had a they had a they had a turkey head on top of the scoreboard. They would go gobble 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 gobble. And then, the scoreboard was in the south end zone. Back then. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Wow. And that yeah. that was not a popular decision with a lot of people to take the uh, the gobbling turkey head off of the scoreboard. But these cups are. Uh, if you look at the cups, there's a lot of fighting gobblers and VPI references. It says VPI. It doesn't say Virginia Tech. It says fighting gobblers. It has the uh, the the classic silhouetted fighting gobbler logo, which is really cool. By which the way, which was worn in the 2012 Russell Athletic Bowl, which we all want to forget. So thank you for game. reminding so, us yeah. of it that. It was a win, uh, at least. Uh, but they sent these cups off to the whoever made them, and they didn't come back go hokies. They came back go hoakies with an extra a in there, h o a k i e s. So that is. No, it's not valuable. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I could try to eBay it, but I'm sure it'd get a buck. Uh, but I don't, I don't remember where I got mine. I think somebody sent me a bunch of cups one time in the early days of uh, Hokie Central and Tech Sidelines. So that's a. have talked way too long about one tiny piece oh. of, of, of set gear. Now, the other thing is I don't know if Malcolm has uh, done it yet because we didn't, we didn't do our production planning before, uh, before we went live. But we now have a camera on me for better or for worse I have my own camera so uh, we purchased a couple of new video cams so the main camera is now on the side on you guys and the two new video cameras one of them is the center camera and another one is the one that's on me across the room so we now got a three camera setup which I've been wanting for a long long time why I don't know I just I know I just want more cuts so a little bit of a uh, podcast behind the scenes um previously the camera that was on you guys was a uh, nikon dslr that that uh, we'd bought before uh last summer before this academic year started and we've been using the nikon to shoot you guys well the nikon has an interesting characteristic where if you're not actively doing something with it it shuts off after 20 minutes yeah, I think we set it to 30, maybe. So part of podcast production, part of Malcolm's job was to get up every 15 or 20 minutes and go over to that camera and, like, tweak it. Like, <laughs> zoom a little bit, zoom back out, do something. I don't I don't know. But uh, he, he would get up and walk over there about every 20 minutes. He doesn't have to do that anymore. We've got cameras that will stay on. So uh, that's kind of the rundown. we got a couple more lights coming in. And, man, we're just about there. So the next step for us is that big TV that we're always putting pictures on, the next step for us is to wire that thing directly to a laptop so we can do maybe some interesting things with it. Uh, one of the long-term goals here with building this set is not just to record the podcast. As awesome as that is, I would like to do just dedicated video-only stuff. So I've enjoyed uh, recording the podcast and putting the video out, and that, that's been really cool, but we want to do more with it. And getting the television to show something other than still photos is, uh, um, is part of that. So interesting little story. I, I don't think I've told this story in the podcast. Stop me if I have. Um, we were sitting here, and during one of our shows, it was, it was the, the run-up to the Duke football game. We were running last year's Duke basketball game on the monitor. So during the entirety of the uh, podcast, it was the second half of the Virginia Tech's win over Duke in basketball last year, not the Sweet 16 on the one that they won in Castle. Um, so we put that podcast video up, and about three days later, I get an email from YouTube uh, with a copyright claim, okay, saying that you use someone else's copyrighted material in your video. You don't have to take the video down. The emails that YouTube sends out are actually really nice. They say you don't have to take the video down, but you don't specifically have the rights to that video. It says things like that copyright belongs to someone else. It doesn't tell you who. Clearly, it's ESPN. It was an ESPN broadcast. And any ad revenue made off of your video will go to the copyright claimant. So 
I don't know if a person saw that or if they've got software that sniffs that stuff out, but I was I was pretty impressed. So you do have to be careful. Like us, this is all original content, us sitting here talking. But with regards to what we put up on the screen there, we got to be careful. Uh, we can't put, I think there's a time limit on it. I think if you want to show a clip to support what you're talking about, your narrative, that's fine. That's fair use. But to sit there and run an entire game like that is it's somebody else can claim that copyright. So I thought that was interesting stuff. So that's just a little bit podcast behind the scenes. Yeah. No, I didn't really think about that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, again, thanks to Clark Rulin for dropping off some uh, some cool things for the podcast set. And uh, it's, it's neat mm -hmm. to see it continue to evolve from where we, we are will continue August. to clutter up the set with all kinds of cool paraphernalia as time goes on. Absolutely. Um, all right, guys, let's dive right into it. It is uh, Georgia Tech Week, and it has been quite some time since the Hokies knocked off the Yellow Jackets 2015, to be exact. Uh, but before we really dive into it, I just want to ask, how thrilled are you guys not to see the triple option this week? I'll let Chris take that one. Very thrilled. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, we will see a little bit. I mean, I saw that they ran it on short yardage situations yeah. against yep. UVA. Um it's the one of the few plays that their offense knows how to execute. So they haven't completely taken it out of the playbook. Now they're gonna not gonna block it by going and diving to people's knees and things like that, probably. But we'll probably we'll see a little tiny bit of it on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. But but yes, on the whole, I'm thrilled. Although last year they blew us out without running the triple option the entire game. They just it was, ran. It was, it was quarterback, quarterback leads the entire time. There was no option in that game at all. They just blew us off the ball. You know, it's a. Uh... Not to go on a bit of a tangent, but you think about that Pittsburgh game last year, complete blowout. Tech never showed up. Georgia Tech game last year. Uh, wasn't that the game where it was fairly competitive and then Sean Savoy bobbled up? Uh, uh, Tech scored first, then Georgia Virginia Tech scored, Tech. then, then – it, it may yeah, have even been tied, or, oh, or yeah, GT was, was it, leading by a score. It was 21-21. Yeah, and Sean Savoy or, dropped It was 21-14 Tech. Wow, and yeah, Sean Savoy okay. dropped a punt and just all oh, hell broke loose. Yeah. It, it was bad after that. Well, first he returned a punt to like the fifty, then it got called back, and then he right, then he fumbled it. Yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> and 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 then the Duke game this year. These are these are memories that you know Virginia Tech's been very competitive the last uh, what are we talking about five games since the Duke game. You know, that, I don't know if Rhode Island really matters. I'm talking about Miami, Notre Dame. Uh, who am I forgetting? UNC. UNC. You know, Virginia Tech's been very competitive. And we want to see that continue. We don't want to see any more Pitt and Georgia Tech from last year or Duke from this year. Yeah, absolutely. I hear you guys. Uh, one, by the way, one of my favorite Georgia Tech things from over the summer, I don't, or no, this is the spring, their spring game, first play of the spring game, quarterback started under center, and then they went to the shotgun, and the crowd lost it in the stands. Sure they so did. Uh, we'll be talking about Georgia Tech in the shotgun and the That's new look cool. offense here on the podcast this week. Uh, as we always do the preview podcast, I want to take some time to focus on Virginia Tech itself before we get into Georgia Tech. Hokies are coming off of one of their best wins of the year against 19th-ranked Wake Forest. Um Chris, what, what do you want to take from that game if you're Virginia Tech? What do you hope to apply to it this week, and what are some areas that you're hoping the team is working on this week in practice? I would say that's the most complete game Virginia Tech has played since Florida State last year. Yeah. That doesn't really count because, that's as we know now, Florida State was terrible. Well, not only that, but Virginia Tech's offensive game wasn't really that complete that night. Well, correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm having a hard time remembering – the last time Virginia Tech played that complete a game. Probably the second half of the Belk Bowl. Yeah, uh, 2016. Right. I, I, can't, I can't recall all of the 2017 season in my mind. Uh, you know. Tech was, there was very good, but the offense was limited because they had so many. Uh, Josh Jackson was a freshman. Savoy was starting as, and a freshman. Clark Keen was starting just as a freshman despite never playing tight end before. Yeah. Just a just bunch of – basically kind of what the defense was last year, the offense was in – 2017 with so many freshmen on the field um as far as complete game offense defense and special teams yeah you probably got to go back to this to that second half uh, against arkansas and since arkansas has gone i think it was nine and 27 and just fired its coach after uh, they fired its second coach since that game that that reminds me of of when when virginia tech way back in 1993 played indiana in the independence bowl indiana had gone to something like eight bowls in 10 years uh bill i think bill mallory was his name was their head coach and and he'd had a good run at indiana especially for indiana football you know you got to remember this is when there were there were fewer than 20 bowls and indiana was going to bowls fairly regular basis tech beat him in that independence bowl and 
that was the end of it. Indiana collapsed after that, and Mallory got fired two or three years later. And uh, so, I'm not going to say Virginia Tech's program killers, but it's just interesting to remember stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. Wish he, but I bet uh, Bilema wishes he never left Wisconsin. Yeah. 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 Well, he, actually, he got let go at the end of the 17th season, so it wasn't after the Balk Bowl per se, right? Because this was Chad. No, oh, cr- right, right, so, right, right. But, so, uh, yeah. yeah, but things so they're hard. So that they're about to be on their third coach since then. Yes. Well, technically, with their intern coach now, they are yeah. on wow. their third coach oh, since man. that game. It's incredible. I, you know, one thing I was thinking about uh, focusing on Virginia Tech here. Early in the season, there were a couple of things that everyone wanted to talk about. One was the running game and how that Tech had to find a way to get it going. Number two was the offensive line and the rotation of, of guys in the youth and Brian Hudson being the fourth string center coming into camp and Tanuta playing. I feel like we have not talked about the offensive line in weeks, and I think that is a good thing. So, Chris, what has changed with this offensive line? Is there more continuity? Are guys in the same spots? Are they still rotating? Why have we not talked about them as much? Would you say that's a good thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say it's a good thing. Um, I think anytime you rush for 200-plus yards, your offensive line obviously had a good game. Uh, I forget the stats I put in Sunday's article, but Tech is averaging, I don't remember the number, but a lot more running, a lot yards. more rushing yards with Hendon Hooker at quarterback. In right. fact, their worst game rushing with Hendon Hooker at quarterback was 153 yards against Miami, and that was better than all but one of the games without Prior him as the that, starting that's quarterback. Right. Yep. Yeah, so I think that I think I've always said that good running backs make offensive lines look better um i mean ryan williams and david wilson made offensive lines look better right uh good good quarterbacks can too uh, if the, if you're running the right kind of offense around them i mean you you look you just look at box scores and say oh they they gave up three sacks that must be the offensive line's fault those two sacks ryan willis took against north carolina were ryan willis's fault yeah right yeah um so it's 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 not always the offensive line's fault. They don't always deserve full credit either. But I, I think obviously they benefit from having the right quarterback and the right system. And and quite frankly, they 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 started three freshmen and two sophomores against Wake Forest. They had three freshmen right next to each other. You've got to forecast some improvement. I mean, guys are going to get better. Bron Hudson's gotten better. That guy never snapped a football before his first game at Virginia Tech, which is incredible th- to think about. That he because he could, he's never snapped a football before, and then he's Virginia Tech starting center. He just that that doesn't happen. Um, so so, so a, a couple things come to mind while you're talking. Number one, you've been looking at the PFF grades, and and Hudson's grade is improving, right? Yeah. 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 Um, it is is it fair that that Doug Nestor is a guy that you feel is kind of he's kind of hit a wall. Yeah. Um, he's got some issues with keeping his feet moving, mm-hmm. uh, which is an issue for. A lot of young football players, regardless of position, you engage in that block and you keep and you forget to keep your feet chopping. Yeah. Um, so, or, or you tackle somebody and you forget to drive through. Yeah, and yeah, just th- hit yeah, him. things like that. Um, yeah. So I mean, ta- Nestor's got talent. Um, he's just got to get through some of those technical things that, quite frankly, most true freshmen redshirt because they they don't do those things properly. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean to bring that up already. <laughs> because I don't, I don't think Doug Nestor. Tally far, mark number one. Are we, right? What, is it, what does the recorder say here, Malcolm? How far <laughs> in are we? My favorite is the comments. People always – someone just commented in all caps the last one, drink with an exclamation point. <laughs> of course. So. Um, I forgot what we were so, talking about. Uh, so, so, but, but, but yeah, so the other true. thing that came to mind was you go back in, in that Wake Forest game, and this is where I wish we had a video component to the podcast. It's the touchdown where McLeese scored easily. Um, I th- I think it's the one that put Tech up 12, 29 to 17. Um, you go back and you watch that play, and, and the, the offensive line basically blocks left, and they, and they annihilate the Wake Forest defensive line. Wake has two guys. Uh, I'm not going to say they're both linebackers. At least one of them's a linebacker that went to fill the hole. And so I, I, I don't remember if that was a read option or not. I think it – it may have been, but McLeese kind of hit out behind the line, and the two unblocked tacklers went with Hooker and went outside with Hooker. And I, and I think we did talk about this just in the last podcast. And do you think they would have gone with Ryan, Ryan Willis? No. No, absolutely not, because he never kept the ball. They would have filled that hole and destroyed McLeese right there at right. the six. Yeah. You know, and so it's – And, the and you know, you're sitting there watching the game on TV maybe if you're at home and you're like – 
oh, what's wrong with the offensive line? They can't block. That's 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 the number one response whenever a running play doesn't work, right? Right, right. Um, but in this case, the offensive line executed that play to absolute perfection. Right. If it hadn't worked, it would have been, you know, it wouldn't have been their fault. No, a lot of the reason it worked was the Wake Forest guys just blew the play. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, good conversation there about the offensive line. Certainly in a different place than we were talking well, about. Well, absolutely. And Furman, Old Dominion, and like I said, they started three freshmen and two sophomores. So. Think about those guys in two years from now. There you go. A couple of them will be redshirting too coming off this year, right? Yeah. So uh, I want to shout out the special teams. I think we sometimes forget to leave out the ACC specials of the week this week, Oscar Bradburn. Uh, and you hear Coach Fuente say it all the time, just what an asset he is and um, he's a weapon. But do you sometimes take for granted having a strong punter like Bradburn? Yeah, you wish you didn't have to use him quite as much always, but but when but when you do have to use him and he does pin you pin the other team down inside the ten and layer yard line, you're always like, man, that guy, he, he can he can win a game for you. Field position can win a game for you. Um, so he so Fuente calls him a game changer back there, and he's absolutely right. For a guy who talks about field position as much as Fuente. Oscar Bradburn is a game changer. Well, is he the, is he one of the best punters in tech history? Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe he holds the record for single season average. I think his I think his average right now is forty eight point six, and I think he set the record last year at forty eight point eight. So certainly, you know, it, it's funny you look across college football, and there, there's a bunch of punters in college football that back in the day when I was growing up, Ray Guy was the man. And, and the Mendoza line or the bar for punters was 40 yards. Can you average over 40 <laughs> yards a kick? <laughs> That's there's quite a, like there's quite a few guys that run less than four minute miles now, and that used to be a thing. Um, but if you go back and look at his, per, his performance in the Wake Forest game, he punted four times. He averaged 50 over 50 yards a kick, and one of those was um, a 41 yard kick where he put it on something like the seven or the nine yard line for Wake Forest. He did. I think he punted from the 50 put it on the nine, and that's a 41-yard punt. If he'd been punting from his own 30, you know, it would have been another 50-plus yarder. Um, so, oh, and oh, by the way, of his four punts, three of them were inside the 20 because uh, he's got the leg to get it to the 20 from almost anywhere. I think his best punt, statistically, you look at the box score and it says that uh, Tech Bradburn punts it from the Virginia Tech 40 to the uh, – let me get it straight now – to the four-yard line of Wake Forest – it's a 56-yard punt, and I don't recall the punt, but somebody on the board said, yeah, now all 56 yards was in the air <laughs> because the uh, Wake Forest punt returner caught it at the four and returned it out to the 11. So it only, quote-unquote, netted 49 yards, but 56 yards in the air to the four-yard line. And that dude, I, I don't know if he had people around him or not, but he probably should have let that one go. <laughs> but I, I think I've seen this in college football, punt returners not really grasping how far back they've been pushed. I'm, I'm not sure that's coached like it was coached when you and I were growing yeah, up Yeah, it used to be if, it, if, plant, the, if the punt's inside the 10, the 10 yeah. let it go. I, I don't think it's necessarily coached that way anymore because if, if, especially if, if you're punting from a short field, you can get your gunners down there really quick yeah. and surround that guy. So if it hits it like the 5, there's a really good chance you're going to down it. So you can so instead of them downing at the two, you tell your guy, okay, put your feet at the five instead. And if you fair catch it on the five, that's fine. It's better than them downing at the one. At least at least the quarterback has a little bit of room. Yep. Um. So I I don't know. I've never. Uh, I didn't yeah, play, it's true. Who uh, knows what the teaching is? I don't know days. what they're teaching these days. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, let's uh, let's keep the conversation going about special teams. Uh, we briefly touched on it in the uh, the comment section of uh, Monday's show, but. Uh, Hezekiah Grimsley comes out as a punt returner. Tavion Robinson in as a great return to begin the second half. Um, w- moving forward, what do you think the Hokies should do at punt return? You know, you, you don't want to anoint someone up when you see them once. Uh, that was his first special teams plays since, I want to say it was either the beginning of the Furman or the ODU game where uh, – he caught the ball with his knee basically touching the ground and uh, and returned it. And they looked at it on replay, and I thought they got the call wrong. I thought his knee was down at like the five-yard line when he caught the kickoff. Just a, okay, this was a kickoff. The, yeah, right. the, this, was, this was Tavion Robinson. And Fuente took him off the kickoff return team, and he has not played a single special teams play since that play. Um, which is understandable. You do that against Miami – 
or somebody like that, you're going to lose a football game because of it, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, you, I don't, don't you don't have much margin for error these days. So I'm sure they will, but they will have a competition in practice this week for sure. Yeah. Um, so, so to be clear, he had two punt returns, a 33 yarder and an 11 yarder for an average of 22. That's pretty darn good. Yep. So we'll yeah. see where it goes. It, it all comes down to, as, as you guys know, do Fuente and she best trust him. Right. And that's for them to answer, not us. Um, how about this? I was uh, listening to Tech Talk Live on Monday. Don't want to make a, a big deal about this per se, but I did find it interesting because I feel like it's been a uh, – both of these guys have been so good all year, it's kind of sparked a conversation. Well, who's, who's maybe the true number one cornerback? Uh, if you go back and look at Jake Lyman's Tech Talk Live notes, Coach Fuente was talking about the opening drive and how much time it took off, and he said, quote, uh, we were going to take the ball. Our best cornerback was out for the first half in Jermaine Waller. Right. Close quote. Or oh, Jermaine. he said our. Hmm. He did so, say our best, our best cover corner, or something like or that. Or he quote our best cornerback was it, out for the first half in Germany. It, it's it's gone back and forth, and you know Waller didn't play well on that first drive of the second half. He had the pass interference call, and then got beat for the touchdown. So now the PFF grades are back in Caleb Farley's favor. Farley right, is right. now the highest grading defender on the team, uh, and and the highest grading corner in the ACC, uh, I, I believe. So it's gone back and forth. You know, Fuente was worried, but honestly, Armani Chapman played a really, really good game. He's he's really developed into a good player. Tech, yeah, so, Tech's got three three good corners now. So Chris, looking at the PFF grades, um, has you know Chapman is his snap counts up high enough, when and he's grading out really well too. Yeah. So maybe uh something good from something bad about Waller getting ejected, opportunity for Chapman, and now the Hogies have another option at at, at corner. Yeah, I mean it's always good to have depth. Problem is he's a redshirt freshman and he's behind two sophomores, so you got to figure out something to do with with these guys next year. But that's a good problem to have. You know what uh, I just heard in that sentence though? Yeah. Hey, what redshirt? Redshirt. <laughs> yeah, he, he did redshirt, redshirt last year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, it's just it, it and and that's what coaches have to manage. They have to keep guys happy. They have to get them playing time. And and that's I wonder if you know one of the things we talk about from time to time is that Virginia Tech isn't blowing many teams out anymore so the backups aren't getting significant playing time like they used to in air quotes back in the day um you know so it, it it's one of those deals where let let's say Tech is blowing a lot of teams out and the backup corners get to play more mm -hmm. even though they're not playing in primetime situations does it still keep them happy that they're actually seeing the field you know and I like having three or four corners because guys get hurt, guys get ejected for targeting, you know, junk like that. So I, I would just hate for the number three corner to think, I got two really good young guys in front of me I need to transfer. No, you don't. You're, you're going to get to play. Yeah, at some point yeah. you're going to get to play. Um, yeah. Fuente actually talked about that. I forget whether it was in his press conference or, or what, or on Tech Talk Live, but uh, he basically said – we didn't. There were a couple teams earlier this year that we we should have blown out, and we didn't blow out. I wanted to get Tavion, Tavion Robinson time as punt returner in those games, but I couldn't do it because we weren't blowing those teams out. Yeah. He actually yeah. did say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah good. Um, by the way, it was a great tech talk live on Monday. I told, Coach Mike Young, he knows how to, uh, to you know, the crowd. You know, just he, he he's he's a fun guy to listen to for sure. And then Coach yeah, he had himself in. something cold to drink while he was there. <laughs> he had a diet coke. Actually, a got diet one coke. for him. Okay. I, I will say that was the most packed. And my, I, I go to Tech Talk Live every week. That was the the crowdest Tech Talk Live I've ever seen on Monday since I've been going to them. So I I, I know one of the uh, and I've known him for a long time. One of the owners, the one of the new owners of, of that establishment. He's trying to get us to do something like do a pre Tech Talk Live show or a post Tech Talk Live show. And all I tell him is, man, by the end of the day Monday, I'm I'm worn out. It's been a whole weekend. It's been all day Monday just going at it. Um, but that's good to hear. Uh, so I'll I'll take that into consideration. I mean, if Mike Young's going to be a big draw, you know, uh, and Fuente's very good on Absolutely. Tech Absolutely, Fuente was great. He, he's different, yeah. So I just want to throw that in there. All right, let's do this. I want to take a, a timeout because I want to spend a good amount of time talking about the 2-7 and seven Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, but why the 2-7 and seven record should not uh, – uh, let Hokies uh, slip their minds about what this Yellow Jackets team has been able to do the last couple of weeks. We'll talk about their new offense, their new coach, a little bit of their defense as well. We'll get to predictions. We'll get to your Facebook uh, Live questions as well. We've got more to get to on the Tech Sideline podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm.
Welcome back to the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm. So glad everybody could join us as we record on Wednesday morning, November the 13th. We've got Malcolm Stewart behind the scenes producing. We've got Chris Coleman, Will Stewart. I'm Evan Hughes. Uh, we just talked a little bit about Virginia Tech and where the Hokies are heading in uh, to their game this weekend against Georgia Tech. Let's shift our attention now to the team in Atlanta, the Yellow Jackets under first-year coach Jeff Collins. Of course, Paul Johnson retiring in the offseason. Away goes the triple option offense that I'm sure many fans around the ACC were just rejoicing in, as Chris already said in the beginning of the podcast. This is a team that is 2-7 and seven right now, uh, has lost to the Citadel, mm-hmm. but the last two weeks have been really good for Georgia Tech. They lost to Pitt 20-10, to 10, lost to UVA 33-28. They were very close. They beat Miami in mm-hmm. overtime three weeks ago. So this is a Yellow Jackets team that's 2-7, and seven, but, Chris, why should Hokie fans not take this Yellow Jackets team lightly, despite the fact that the Georgia Tech's won three in a row? Well, they're showing signs of life. And, and, you know, when you have a team that knows they don't have much of a chance of success, but they're still playing really hard at this point in the season, you know, I think that says good things about Jeff Collins. It says good things about the mental makeup of their players. they got a very talented running back who breaks a lot of tackles, and their quarterback who used to be committed to Virginia Tech, James Graham, uh, committed to Tech as like a DB slash running back. Uh, he can really throw the deep ball. Uh, their passing game, short to intermediate game, it's it's rough. But but they can generate big plays in the passing game. You know, it's funny you talked about how Georgia Tech fans cheered when they went out of shotgun in, in the spring game. And, oh, man, we got a new offense. We're going to play. We're finally getting away from that triple, triple option, which I'm sure Georgia Tech fans thought was limiting their program and everything like that. Right. When if you actually look at it, they – pretty much average the same amount of wins running it as they did before they ran it. But anyway, <laughs> you, you change to a regular offense, then uh, you come out and you lose to the Citadel and you score two points against Temple. And then everybody's like, probably like, oh, maybe we should run the triple option mm-hmm. again <laughs> because we cannot score. And it's going to take them a couple of years to reshape the it's roster. It's going to take them a couple of years, two or three years. Um, and it's, I mean, that's a ma- – your average person who, if you never played football, does not understand the difference. And, I mean, it's, it affects every position on offense. Your quarterback isn't used to throwing the football. He's not used to dropping back, making multiple reads. Your offensive line, they're used to they're, – they're taught one technique when it comes to blocking. They, they don't know how to block people and stay on their feet. They've never been asked to pass block, so they don't know how to do that. You don't have any tight ends on your roster because Paul Johnson never used any tight ends. Uh, your, your running back is used to taking handoffs as a B-back, a fullback, basically, with his hand in the ground. He's not used to uh, standing right beside a quarterback, reading zone blocking. Your wide receivers don't know what a passing tree is because they've never – Never been exposed to a modern offense, so all of this has to be taught from ground up, uh, from the ground up. You're starting from scratch. It's like, it's like maybe you're like a seventh grade football coach, and you got a bunch of guys who have never played football before. I mean, you got to teach them everything. Yeah. So this is a monster rebuilding job at Georgia Tech. But the impressive thing about them is that they've they've kept their heads in it, and they have improved as as the season has gone on. They're a dangerous team. Um, what concerns you is Virginia Tech has played three very emotional games in a row. Um, I, I think they, this team has shown – they've proved that they can respond to adversity. Now they have to prove that they can respond to having success. Go on the road against a 2-7 and seven football team, and can you bring the same intensity that you brought to Notre Dame, that you brought to Wake Forest, that you brought to UNC? That's the challenge this week. The good thing is Justin Fuente can point to George Tech and say, man, these guys physically embarrassed you last year, and they've beaten you three years in a row. I don't care what their record is. That group of players over there kicked your butt last year, and that should be enough motivation right there, in my opinion. You can also turn on the film. Uh, James Graham is, is a scary player. He's only a redshirt freshman. You yeah. know, and, and so Virginia Tech's, you know, assuming everything stays on its normal course, Virginia Tech's going to be dealing with him for a while. And, you know, I think Chris captured pretty well that they don't have a, a, a short to intermediate passing game. They, they will hit the big one on you. They've yeah. got a receiver that averages 21.2 yards a catch on 17 catches and has five touchdowns. They, they will hit the deep ball. You know, by contrast, uh, 
If I remember correctly, Damon Hazeldon has 22 catches, averages about 17.8 per catch, and has six touchdowns. So they they got a guy that can that can get deep. Fortunately, Virginia Tech has good cover corners. Um, Graham is slippery. You know, he's going to keep the play alive. He's going to be that guy, that guy that everybody hates to play against. And their running back, Jordan Mason, is is good too. I, I don't know. I've, got, I've got Mason. Jordan stuff. Mason, seven hundred fifty three yards on the ground. I think he leads. Now wait a minute. I think the seven fifty three is, is total. I think his net is seven sixteen. Gotcha. Yeah, but he averages five point six yards a carry. You know, and their second best running back. Well, actually, Tobias Oliver isn't a running back. We he's a wide receiver. I guess they use him in the rushing game. He averages five point one a, a carry and has two touchdowns. Well, he was our so, starting quarterback at the beginning of the season. Yeah, so a lot yeah, of those he, rushing yards came from that. And so uh, one of the pictures we that, that we're going to put in the preview today is Tobias Oliver <laughs> running that that quarterback sweep that they just ran and ran and ran last year. Um, so they, you know, don't sleep on him, man. Be careful. You know, um, um, you got to got to make sure you stay sharp and. and and, and they stay were, into the game. They were hanging tough that, with UVA last week. That, I mean, that, it was a back and forth. Their running back leads the ACC all running backs and missed tackles forced percentage. Yeah. Even It's uh, like 40-some percent. E- yeah, yeah, even higher than the Clemson guy, um, which is very impressive. So so that means the first guy to hit him 40-plus percent of the time so, doesn't make doesn't the Doesn't tackle. tackle him, something like that. So Tech's got to do it like they did A.J. Dillon and Swarm, Man. you know, because uh, this guy – this is I don't know if he those Carolina backs were good too, but he's this guy's different. He's six one, two twenty, two twenty five. It kind of reminds me of Cedric Humes a little bit. Yeah, um, just a very good player who, if they were if they were winning more games and if they uh, and they were protecting more leads and things like that, this guy would be a thousand yard rusher. He may end up being that anyway. I'm not exactly. I'm, I don't know. Who well, they got three games left, and he needs, he needs about yeah, almost three hundred. One of those yards. games is against Georgia, so probably not. Right, uh, and but, and hopefully he won't get a hundred against Virginia right, Tech. Right. Right. Um, now the good thing is Tech's running rush defense has been just dominant recently. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just absolutely dominant. Oh. So, so you ran the numbers, isn't it? Something like if if and, and I, I I can't regurgitate them, but I looked at Tech's. Uh, I was just looking at the running games last night, the 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 game by game rushing totals for Virginia Tech's offense and defense, and for Georgia Tech's offense. And yeah, Virginia Tech's rushing defense has been pretty phenomenal. Yeah, for the last five games, you know, maybe six. Yeah. Um, and and by the way, we should have said this before. But whenever we say Tech today, we mean Virginia we Tech. We mean Virginia Tech. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we uh, can't stop ourselves from calling Virginia Tech Tech. Tech. Hoacky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah that's, that's it. We'll just call them the Hoacky's the rest of the time. That'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Too many syllables. Um, but uh, I think the, I think the, if you take Virginia Tech's rushing defense in the last five games or so, it'd be something like the second or third best rushing defense in the ACC. And mm-hmm. way up there nationally, some yes. some ridiculous number like tenth or twelfth or eighth in the country. Yeah. So Virginia Tech is defending the run very well. Like Clemson, Pitt, good yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 Uh, here's a couple of notes. I always I always like going through the uh, Tech game notes and always reading a couple of stats out, like going into going into this week. So a couple things to keep in mind right now. The first of all, the offense has been putting up a lot of points lately, minus the Notre Dame game. Oh, so Score. let me interrupt you and say I used to harp on Virginia Tech for not scoring 30 <laughs> points in ACC play. Yeah. At one point, they'd only done it three times in 16 ACC games. And if I'm correct, Virginia Tech has scored 30 points in the last 30 plus in the last three ACC That's games. That's correct. Miami, UNC, and Wake Forest. So let's give credit where credit is due. So let me read through a couple of things. Here. Sorry, so first to inter- of all, sorry to interrupt, but I, I derailed you. No, you know, you're fine. No, no, no. So Tech is. 22 I'm sorry Virginia Tech is 22 and 3 when scoring 30 plus points under Fuente. Tech is average Virginia Tech we know. Lord, thank you <laughs> uh, has averaged 35 points in its last 5 games. Um dating back to 2015 the Hokies are 28 and 1 when holding opponents to 21 points or fewer and Virginia Tech has won 23 straight games when limiting foes to 17 points or fewer. They're 4-0 in 2019. See, that's interesting because we'll get into predictions later, and I'm predicting Georgia Tech to score 17 points. Uh, Georgia Tech has been outscored 235-123 to in its seven losses and has been held to 24 points or fewer in six of those games. And the last thing I'll say is Georgia Tech has trailed at half in all seven of its losses and has been outscored – 152 to 44 in the first half in so 2019. Not, not, a, not, not a lot. 
So, all right. Uh, anyways, a couple of uh, interesting stats there. We talked about the offense quickly. Will I know you get the uh, roster card, which by the way is a great, um, great asset and part of the uh, the game preview. Tell us a little bit about the defense, and I always just love to get an idea of how many underclassmen, how many upperclassmen on the defensive side of the football. So Georgia Tech starts zero seniors on defense. This will be the only game of the season, I'm sure, where Virginia Tech has more senior starters on defense than the other team. Yeah, That's one with Reggie Floyd, One. Right? Right. And so let's count the juniors, and this includes red shirts. I combine juniors yep. and red shirt juniors. One, two, three, four. So zero seniors, four juniors on D. Sophomores is one, two, three, four, five, and two freshmen. So zero, four, five, two. I feel like I'm reading the Virginia Tech roster. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be a rare game where Virginia Tech is not at an extreme disadvantage yeah. when it comes to experience. Uh, you know, these 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 two teams are going to have a good rivalry for the next. And the, I think the Coastal in general is going to get – it's pretty miserable this year. It's going to get a lot better next year and the year after. Um you know, Miami's had a couple of good games. I don't want to say that whatever was going on with You don't them, want to say that you was back. Uh, I really don't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, Georgia Tech is uh, – Jeff Collins has already got him playing well and playing hard, and he's recruiting fairly well. Um, he's got currently three four-star commitments and a bunch of three-star guys. Uh, they're, they're somewhere around 20 to 25th in the country in the recruiting rankings. Part of that is because they have 23 commitments more than the teams around them. But I just – I think what Collins is doing there, I think it's going to be pretty good. He seems to be a good coach. You know, certainly Virginia Tech's going to get better, more mature. Uh, you know, Duke's going to be Duke. Don't know what's going to happen to UVA once Bryce Perkins exits town. Yeah, that, that, but... that doesn't – that that said, I think UVA maximizes their talent. I don't think they recruit particularly well. I don't see a lot of game changers for them, but they're they're tough and they're physical, you know. And sure. and yeah, so I think the coastal is going to get. Uh, I'm leaving out Pitt. I think I, I don't really have a feel for Pitt. The, I think the coastal's bottoming out right now, and I think there's going to be some some. I think they're going to be very competitive with each, with each other over the next few years. I'm not going to say they're going to be one of the top divisions in football. That's silly. Well, you know, the crazy thing is is the Coastal has a bad rep this year. But before Minnesota this past week, who came the closest to beating Penn State? Pitt. Pittsburgh, yeah. And, right. And, and, who, and I don't want to say they really should have, but they had the ball right down there at the end of a one-score game. Who almost won at Notre Dame with a backup Virginia quarterback? Tech. Virginia, Virginia Tech. Tech. You know, who beat South Carolina in Charlotte? Who went on to beat Georgia? That would uh, be that North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. Right. So, I mean, the Coastal's got some good wins. Who this knocked year. off UCF in their long uh, regular season wins? That would be Pittsburgh. Yeah. Right. So, and there's one thing about Pittsburgh. One of the happiest I've ever seen Chris Coleman on this podcast set going back to last year was when we went through the roster card of Pittsburgh and he was gushing over Pat Narduzzi and like the 30 plus red shirts that were on the team. What, what they that start 21 went, seniors against yes. Tech last year? They they had, they 21, had 21 seniors, seniors. Or, or 20 or 20 or 21 seniors and they were all red shirts. All, all, all red shirts. And so I'm yeah. sure in two or three years from now when and, now this younger group's all red shirted, Chris is just going to check, and, check. And, and, and that's why they stomped Tech last year. It's also why they're – one of the worst offenses in the country this year. Their defense is, is very good this year, but you know, when you lose that many seniors and, and it's all your offensive linemen and all your running backs, yeah. that, you know, that's that's just not it's not conducive. You're going to take a dip. Yeah, you're going to take a dip. All right, so let's dive into some predictions now here on the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm. Virginia Tech at Georgia Tech. It's a 3.30 kick in Atlanta on Saturday. Um, the Hokies are trying to get their first win over Georgia Tech since – since when they became coach. Yep, it was Coach Beamer. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was his first game after he announced his retirement it was. as well. Uh, and he was celebrating sure that. Was. So, it was 11 days after he announced his retirement. Well, I'm going to start with you. Does Bud Foster go out a winner against Georgia Tech? He does. Um, so, uh, first of all, and you'll see all of this in our game preview, I encourage you to uh, to read it because there's there's a lot of numbers in there that will make you understand. It'll It'll provide the, the background to what I'm about to say. If you look at the running games, um, Georgia Tech's rush defense has gotten better over the last five games or so. They're, they're quote-unquote, limiting teams to 150 to 180. 
for the season, it's worse than that, but really they're trending up in rush defense. Uh, Virginia Tech is trending way up in rush defense and up in rushing offense. If you analyze the running game, Virginia Tech has a better running game on both sides of the ball. Um, that's, that's, that's good. Uh, the, that's an indicator that the Hokies are going to win this thing. Um, I think that the, the Georgia Tech offense will have a lot of trouble being consistent with the passing game but they might hit you with a big play. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say Virginia Tech's going to hold them to seven or ten points. I'd love to see that, and it may actually They happen. are scoring around 20 points uh, or, or more on teams right now, except for Pitt. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they're, they're going to get theirs, I think. Uh, and Virginia Tech has a huge advantage on special teams. I think that I think that all adds up to a 31-17 to win for the Hokies. I, I look for them to continue scoring over 30 on offense i think georgia tech will i I actually want to say i think georgia tech will sting them here and there for you know (laughs) some some yards and some scores and so 31 17 is where i'm going virginia tech yeah i think i picked it 34 17 maybe i I don't remember um but i guess i'll find out when i post my preview yeah i don't remember i think you were 34 20 34 20 okay so we were about the same um we always are we generally are they're they're worrisome because they're two and seven, right? And you don't know how a young team is going to respond going on the road. Playing into two and seven team after you play three really emotional games in a row against three, you know, pretty good to very good teams. So I, I, it worries me from that standpoint. But I do feel like that unless Tech is negative in turnover margin, it's going to be tough for Georgia Tech to win the game. I just don't think they quite have enough firepower. Um, I, I think Tech will Virginia Tech will win, um, but I don't think I don't expect it to be some like four quarter blowout or anything like that. Uh, I, I would be very really pleased if that's what happens. Oh man, yeah, if that happens, that's something that that hasn't happened to Georgia Tech in over a month. They're trending up. I mean, they what they did against UVA last week was really impressive, and you know I watched the condensed version of that game yesterday to prepare me for the game preview, and. That was the game was in Charlottesville, and they lost it by five. And they lost the game on special teams. They clanked a field goal off the upright, and then they allowed a kickoff return to the 50-yard line, which UVA turned into a, a touchdown. Yeah. So, other than that, the game was even. So, Virginia Tech has to take advantage of, of their advantage on special teams and don't turn the ball over, and I think they'll be okay. So I think a bigger concern and the thing that worries me the most is the fact that I'm 0 for 5 on picking ACC games this year. <laughs> and here I'm picking Virginia Tech to win. I think that's a bigger factor in the game than anything we can sit here and analyze. we got to break that trend. We didn't wear any Georgia <laughs> Tech. I was about to say, we need you to be wearing like a gold Georgia Tech uh, polo. Right Evan's now, just looking though. at me like, I don't know what to do with that. No, no, I'm just <laughs> – We need to have the Evan cam. <laughs> I mean, we kind of do, but we need to have an <laughs> Evan cam. <laughs> oh my gosh okay so we've got two hokey wins over georgia tech here from will and chris uh 34 20 31 17 the two schools yeah and the, the thing is you know you still feel like virginia tech has another loss in them i, I hope not but... i hope not but the thing is i don't think pitt's offense is good enough to beat tech and uva is i think i think we see uva for what they are now a hard playing team but with a lot of warts at the same time. Yeah, so let me jump in and say you talked about watching that condensed game, Virginia Tech and Georgia, excuse me, Virginia and Georgia Tech. I did the same, and it was just Bryce Perkins, Bryce Perkins, Bryce Perkins, yeah. Bryce Perkins. So, yeah. and that that's no secret, but anyway. Right. So. Yeah, it's going to be fun up on uh, in Charlottesville on Black Friday, but that's a podcast for another time. Let's go over to Malcolm Stewart. Wearing a nice little Callaway jacket there, Tech sideline hat. What's going mm. on, Malcolm? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Well, you guys can't see it, but according to the stream, I'm sitting next to Chris right now yeah. via the webcam. Uh, so that's a new enhancement <laughs> to the podcast set. Malcolm yeah. now has a webcam on him, oh, so nice. that's new. So he can position himself anywhere he wants to. So you got to watch the video later, Evan. Malcolm is currently sitting next to Chris <laughs> on the couch. That's anyway. awesome. <laughs> High tech. That's awesome. High tech yeah. studios. That's right. And the future. All right, let's start with Adam Withers. Thoughts on – actually, let's combine a couple. Eric Fisher asks, do you think the uh, D will be dialed in for the rest of the season, writing the do it for Bud Wave? And then along with that, what do you think of the Tisdale and Dax combo at the end of the weight game? Well, I think the Tisdale and Dax combo was good. 
As good as Richard Ashby is, I don't think you're going to see a lot of drop off if he can't play. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think I think Dax is, is is better suited for Mike. We've always said that. Yeah. Um, that being said, I want to get Richard Ashby back. Yep. Um, I mean, I don't want that guy off the field. Um, now, what was the other part? Oh, do you think the defense will keep playing well? Yeah, riding the do it for Bud Wave. You know, uh, emotion will only take you so far. Uh, I mean, at some point, you know, you've got to execute, right? Um, I think emotion is good in small doses in football. I think it's very valuable in small doses. Yeah. I don't think it lasts for multiple games. I mean, there has to be execution in there, and, and you got to be dialed in. Now, that being said, I don't see any sign. I, all we've – over the last one-plus month, this defense has done nothing but get better each and every week. Yeah. I don't see any indication of that changing. And I'm not saying that statistically they're going to improve each and every game, but the last three games are good matchups for them. These are limited offenses that they are facing over the last three weeks of the season. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Bud is enjoying game planning for a non-chop block offense, you know, <laughs> as they head down to Atlanta. Um, I, I think the defense is starting to feel it. Um, you know, uh, earlier in the season, uh, I thought there were, there were improvements at a lot of positions, but, but, you know, you could, you could watch the film and you could see repetitive weaknesses, mm-hmm. uh, certain guys and certain run fits as well, we've talked well, about. Well, the, the safeties just played their best game against Wake Forest. And you saw what the defense is capable of it's when a, the safeties play well. Because yeah. pretty much everybody else was playing well for most of the season and they weren't getting good safety play. They played a great game against Wake Forest when they got good safety play. And honestly, that's the concern against George Tech. It seems like their deep balls come over the middle. Ah, okay. So, um, File that one away. Yeah, the so, one they hit against UVA did. Yeah, so I, I – Sorry. I, I, but, no, that's fine. I, I think that defense is uh, – I think they're feeling it, and I think they're going to be inspired to keep it up, you know, because they finally put things together after a year and a half of just, you know, coughing up big plays here and there and not playing well. So, mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, There's a couple questions about Chamari Connor. Mm-hmm. Uh, he seems to be struggling in coverage. Did you move <laughs> Chapman or Ladler into his spot? Uh, ever, ever since I wrote an article talking about how about awesome how great he, he is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he's got an injured hamstring, apparently. Right. And uh, it's tough to get over those hamstring injuries. They've been mixing Ladler in. Um, Chapman, you know, I, he's a guy that, depending on who you're playing, how run heavy they are. If you're pay, playing a pass heavy team, I would not have an issue playing him at the nickel spot at all. Um, I don't know if you necessarily want to do that against Pitt, G- Pitt or Georgia Tech or, or UVA. Um, but yeah, I mean, if if you were if you were facing North Carolina, maybe maybe that that's an option. Um, but I don't know. But Bud Bud's we'll see what Bud, Bud dials up. I expect we'll see some kind of combination of of Connor. And Ladler, though. Okay. That's my opinion. Yeah, it's something to watch. Good question. Yeah, it is a good question. All right. Uh, John Houchins, uh, what's your opinion of UVA's new AD as it relates to UVA football? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, go ahead, Evan. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just, this, this, this is a loaded question, I feel like. Well, it, 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 you know, it's a – I'll gather myself here. Carla Williams, right, mm-hmm. <clears throat> from Georgia. I, I don't think she's ever been a – head AD before she was assistant AD at Georgia. And and I don't know that, again, I don't follow UVA all that closely. I, I just see things from the outside. And I don't know if UVA made a decision we want to be better in football. Uh, intelligent athletic departments make that decision all the time, <laughs> you know. So you would like to think that was part of their thinking for hiring her out of Georgia. And uh, um, I'm impressed so far. Uh, one of the things that I've been harping on on our message boards is uh, – you know, they've, they've got a vision, and we may have talked about this on the podcast before, they've got a vision for facilities that is inspiring and impressive. Uh, the area where University Hall and the John Paul Jones Center is, uh, they're, they're, they're going to redo that whole area and build a new football operations center, do some practice field stuff, do some things for other sports. It's a $180 million project. And if you if you Google it, I can't remember what they call it, but you wind up on a very simple, very inspiring page, and and it's all about getting football better. One of the things she did, they had they had an off week or something at some point, and about a month or two ago, she took all of her top staffers down to Georgia and walked them through their operation to show them how they do things down at Georgia. 
So it looks as if they're getting serious about football. And this is a problem for Virginia Tech because, uh, you know, it used to be UVA was a huge recruiting problem in in state. They haven't been lately. Um, It's been outside schools, uh, Penn State, SEC schools, Ohio State, that sort of thing. If UVA becomes a force in state recruiting, if they get to be jazzy and sexy, and you know how these things wax and wane over time, you know, Virginia Tech's going to have to battle in st- have in state recruiting battles with all those other schools and UVA, which really hasn't been happening lately. Uh, so I don't, I don't even remember the original question, but it, what she's up to looks, uh, looks like an effort to return them to where they were in the 90s. And, uh, you know, They've, they've certainly got the resources for it. I don't like to use the phrase sleeping giant. Um, that said, as Chris likes to say, that said, you watch that condensed game of their game against Georgia Tech. UVA is in contention for the coastal title, and there are still a ton of empty oh seats in that God. stadium. Just swaths, of, swaths of empty seats. It's you know, and, and I thought early, particularly early in the season, I thought Virginia Tech was trending in that direction, but no. No. They've sold out two games since then. So one of the things that Virginia Tech has in it is a huge advantage over UVA right now, for what it's worth, is the fan support and the commitment to the program. That's the one thing that I think is going to be hard for Carla Williams to turn around. She's doing all the right things, and we'll just see where it goes from here. I'll also note that uh, she's taken the SEC scheduling philosophy. Right. They are playing Liberty the week before they play for their Tech. rival first they have a bye week and then they play liberty and virginia tech is responding by doing the exact same thing a couple of times will you've looked at this I, I updated the future schedules yesterday with the, our, our future schedules on tech island have fallen pretty far behind and uh there's there's a few games against liberty for virginia tech in november the week before they play uva right so when you start complaining about that schedule in a few years realize that there's a reason for that because yeah. uva is doing it and can't let them have a competitive advantage, now, right? Now, now, the weird thing about Virginia Tech is if if they're on the road against UVA, they'll, they'll play Liberty at home the week before. If they're hosting UVA, they'll play Liberty on the road, which is odd, and that's a whole other topic of discussion. Yeah, yeah that's not so. that's not SEC-like. <laughs> Very not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, that's a really good question, and I agree with all those thoughts. Yeah. All right, I like this question from Ronnie Adams. Uh, best player that doesn't have a banner in lane? Mm-hmm. All right. Wow. So you got mm. Vic, you got Bruce Smith, you got Frank Loria, you got Corey Moore. Is Jim Pine up there? Jim Pine, I believe, is up there. Jay Grove. Grove is up there. Wow. Did, did we forget anybody Coach else? Beamer. Cornell Brown. You know, well, yeah, Cornell, Cornell. Brown's up there. Uh, uh, let's let's uh, let's go to the running backs. Kevin Jones had a productive career. Uh, was never involved in in national award discussions, though. Yeah. Correct. I, I think one of the best pure football players to ever come through Virginia Tech, and his career was somewhat limited, was Ryan Williams. Um, that's a guy I would take in a heartbeat. Sure. I'm not saying the banner should be hanging there, but that guy could play. Yeah. Uh, man, I love me some yeah. Ryan Williams. I would say either Flowers or Vince Hall are, yeah. are the best two pure defensive players I've seen, just pure football players. Um, as a former corner, I'm a little biased towards Flowers because I just think he's the absolute best I've ever seen in a Tech uniform. Uh, so if I was going to put anybody up there personally, it would probably be Brandon Flowers. Mm. And I, I know there are rules. They have rules about certain – about things like uh, you have to win a national award or, or something. Or be they're, a, they're either guidelines or flat-out rules. They're flat-out rules. Yeah. So like for basketball, you can't retire anybody's jersey unless they win a national award. These days, like I would retire Justin Robinson's jersey. He's the all, school's all-time leader in assists. He was the face of the program that made three NCAA tournaments for the first time in school history and the Sweet 16 for the first time in school history. Um, I would retire his jersey, but they can't because of rules and that they set themselves. Right. And they set these rules as like, okay, you have to win a national award or something like that, right? And, well, and I think that happened after they put they hung the Ace Custis right, right. banner. Then they, in in response, hung an Alan Bristow banner. And then I think they made the rules. Right. Out. Then they made the rules for that. And I I think in these days of the one and done, you've you've got guys coming in winning awards that are college players for one year. And guess what? They should they should be playing in the NBA. Right. So Justin Robinson may not have a chance to win point guard of the year because, you know, they got a lottery pick winning it. 
in the one year he's in college. And that, that's stuff guys didn't have to deal with back in the day. That's very true. Um, so I, uh, but you could write a whole article. I could write a whole article about that. But, but yeah, to answer the question, I would put flowers up there if I had to put anybody up there. Wow, that's interesting. From someone who's in college, Malcolm, maybe you can relate because of the Hokies that we grew up with. I feel like mm-hmm. you know, the three people that come to mind, like Sean Glenn is the first quarterback I re- remember, so to mm-hmm. kind of put that into crazy perspective. But I would think about Tyrod. I would think about Eddie Royal. And I would think about Cam Chancellor uh, in gonna, my lifetime. I was going to say Eddie Royal. Th- those yeah. are the three that – I can remember is as, as Tyrod's not up there. Mm-mm. I guess not. Mm. Tyrod's pro- yeah. Tyrod's got to be the guy Ooh. that should. Yeah, be up yeah, there. that's a guy. That's a good point. Can't believe yeah. I missed that. Uh, yeah, one. yeah, he's not up there, huh? So an interesting thing, and and I I look I was looking through receiving record yesterday. Oh, by the way, Damon Hazelton with I believe he's got 14 career touchdown catches is now 10th on the list for a career despite having played basically a season and a half. Uh, but in looking at that, you know, Cam Phillips I think had over 3,000 yards receiving. Is way ahead in catches. I think he had 236, and Isaiah Ford had something like 214. But but Cam's not a guy you would think we need to hang a hang a banner for that guy. Right. Yeah. Good uh, good consistent player over time. No, no, I'll tell you who sometimes <clears throat> sometimes guys are a victim of the era, era they play in. Andre Davis was a second round pick, and he's the fastest player I've ever seen for Virginia yeah, Tech. Yeah. And if that dude played in a modern offense, I mean, can you imagine what he would do in a modern offense? Getting him the ball in space. Yeah. He, I mean, he would absolutely blow it away yeah. these days in the current Virginia Tech offense. He would be unstoppable. Eddie Royal in the current modern offense is in the slot? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, you look at what Isaiah Ford and Cam Phillips, two fringe NFL players, did in Justin Fuente's offense. And before that, even Scott Leffler's offense. Yeah. Put Andre Davis in this current offense. Oh my gosh! Everybody'd be talking about him winning the Bolitnikoff Award. I think, and I don't want to start a whole other discussion. I think Eddie Royal is probably one of the most criminally underused players in the history That's, of Virginia Tech football. Oh, we played him on the outside as much as we did the slot. If not well, more, was he making twenty five, thirty catches yeah, a year? That's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. He was great in the NFL for a couple of years too. The Broncos. And... I think he caught more passes as a rookie than probably he did his, his entire his entire tech career, career yeah, or yeah. close. Yeah. Hmm. Good stuff. All right, one more maybe, Malcolm? Anything else? Yeah, uh, Michael Yeager. How long has it been since we've had enough defensive line depth to make shift changes like when the whole Been a long line... time. And they've been doing it lately. I saw uh, Somebody alerted it to me. You don't need to alert me to this stuff. But somebody pointed it out to me, and then, then I saw a shift change against Notre Dame mm-hmm. where they bring four guys in. Yeah. That's good, man. Gosh, how long has – it's been a while since they had the well, defensive tackles it's, it's, it's to been, do that. It's been a while that the, since – since they've had the quality depth to do it. Right. I mean, you can do it, but some of the guys they were doing it with before you didn't necessarily want to be doing so, it. So with. let's run through it now. Belmar and uh, Garbage, um, and Garbage Jay- start. Right. Um, and you can bring in Jalen Griffin uh, and Eli Adams. He did not Adams. play in the last game because of the virus, so they played Eli Adams on the right. Yeah. And and Beckton played a lot more against Wake right. Forest, because, and he played on the left since Adams was playing on the right. Yeah. With, uh, so – and Becton's not quite there yet, but he was. But, he, but you he got four better. or five defensive yeah, yeah, ends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You it, definitely got four defensive tackles. Those guys yeah. can play. And and you start uh, so you start Hewitt and um, Crawford. Um, Hewitt and Crawford and Pollard. You've, and, you've got and Kendricks, Kendricks and Pollard, and that's 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 without even Jaden Cunningham being available. And Josh Fugger. He's is available if you really needed him because he did play against UNC. Really. But I, th- I think and you had Porsche playing a little bit before he decided to. I'm telling you, man, it's it's uh, transfer, and all, transfer and all of these guys are going to be here. A uh, couple, most all of them are going to be here. Well, they're all oh, they're all be here year. next year. We know that. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Virginia yeah. Tech's going to bring back something like twenty of twenty-two starters or twenty-one of twenty-two. I mean, I'm excited about the rest of the season, but part of me, you know, wishes you could just push the fast forward button <laughs> to next September. Right? You know what I wish? I wish that that Penn State game was one more year out. <laughs> You yeah. know, because Penn State also is a relatively young team. Uh, yeah. If you look in Virginia Tech's game notes, uh, uh, the Hokies have five seniors on the roster. Texas A&M's got five, and uh, Penn State has ten. And those are, like, supposedly the three fewest numbers of seniors in, in the country. So, you know, if, if Penn State's coming on, clearly they're a top ten team, and, and most of them are going to be back next year. So, Absolutely. Great right. questions. Uh, yeah. are, you st- are you still on the couch, Malcolm? <laughs> <laughs> it's no longer on the couch. That's all. I can't wait to go back and look at that. Uh, 
great week of uh, great week of podcasting. First of all, the uh, the Wake Forest win that was fun recapping that. Uh, we're recording on Wednesday morning, so I didn't want to preview basketball, but they do play USC Upstate tonight, um, and I'm sure we'll have tweet coverage at Tech Sideline. Um, but yeah, Hokies trying to go three and zero there. Do you want to shout out by the way? NCAA uh, women's soccer tournament released. The Hokies women's soccer team are hosting a first round uh, game for the first time since 2015. They'll play Xavier on Friday night. Mm-hmm. Uh, men's soccer uh, upset Louisville in the first round of the ACC tournament, and then went to penalty Wake kicks oh, against had... Wake Forest. Now, to be fair, they probably shouldn't have even been in the penalty kick situation because they were down two goals very late, scored a couple, which is rare. You know, to, to send it in overtime. But, yeah, they lined up that last penalty kick. If it goes in, Virginia Tech wins, and it didn't. And then uh, – Tech's men's team is, like, seventh in the RPI. Yeah. They're the only team – they're the only top ten team in the RPI that doesn't have ten wins on the season. Yeah. And their schedule is just – How ridiculous brutal. the ACC, ACC soccer. Yeah. It's, uh, so, anyways, the women's yeah. repl- the men's, uh, men's selection show is on Monday. Uh, we talked about wrestling on, on wrestling is going to Ohio State. Ohio right? State, it's gonna be a big, big duel. So I looked at WrestleStat, and WrestleStat predicts a twenty-five to ten Ohio State win. But three of those matches project are projected one point wins for Ohio State. So hmm. surprisingly, if if you just go by WrestleStat, which for a novice like me is kind of a good guide. That thing could be close. The, the final score, I mean, 25 to 10 with three really close matches, what if those Absolutely. three go the other way? They're certainly challenging themselves with their schedule early, aren't they? You know, that's the thing about wrestling, man, is those guys don't mess around. No, no, You no. know, they just anybody, anywhere. Yeah, and I'm not talking about Virginia Tech wrestling. I'm talking about wrestling in general. Yeah. They, And it's the whole thing that draws Penn State recruits so well, even though they got a ton of guys already there that are really good. Wrestlers, since they go, they when when they want to go against the best in practice. Right. It's just it's it's it might be a, a unique sport from the standpoint that the better your team is, the better you recruit because the guys you recruit want to go against your team. You know, and it's um so they they don't wrestlers love to go against top competition. One hundred percent. Um, I'm trying to think of other sports. I think it's about it. Volleyball's wrapping up their season. What's women's basketball up to? Women's basketball, big win against George Mason on Sunday. They actually went to George Mason. They're one of the top teams in the A-10. Folks, get to know the name Elizabeth Kitley, ACC uh, Freshman of the Week. Um, she is, as Kenny Brooks has said, has not had a post presence like her since she's been here. I believe she was a... Don't quote me on this. I believe she was a top 50 recruit. It was a big get I for think them you may be get right, Kitley. Yeah. And uh, they still shoot the ball really well, but they also go inside. And then, name to keep it out, Taja Cole uh, was uh, a transfer from Georgia. And I believe she led the SEC in assists last year. I don't have my notes in front of me. Transferred to Virginia Tech as a grad student. So, they've got some pieces. Women's basketball. You, you like the way the Golden State Warriors play basketball? It's Virginia Tech women's basketball is like the the Warriors 2.0. Well, the the key for Kenny Brooks is you know they they've killed it in in the out of conference portion of the schedule for uh, I mean you follow them closer than I do, and and then they they have they have trouble when they hit ACC. No, they play. lost all those they blew all those big leads at the beginning of ACC play last year. Yeah, closed out the season really strong. Fairly yeah, it was well, too yeah. late. Yeah. yeah, I believe they won like six of their final seven something eight nine like or that, something. Yeah. Uh, but uh, actually, I had a shot to get the NCAA tournament. They were they were on the bubble going into the tournament last right. year. But uh, they're young, they're fun to watch, and uh, there's some good talent there uh, with women's basketball. So. Yeah, wrestling. I think we hit on just about uh, just about everything right now. But yeah, good things going on. I was just thinking about last weekend how good it was for Tech Athletics. Mike Young, his first home win of his career. Bud goes out with the win, big mm-hmm. win for football. Wrestling it was great. Weather it was a great all around weekend for uh, for Tech yeah, Athletics. Clean sweep, man. Yeah. yeah, and it was a good week for us here on the Tech Sideline Podcast. It's an even better week to become a subscriber if you haven't done so yet. Uh, yeah, so let, pretty- let me if 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 anybody's still listening, <laughs> let me let me make the pitch. You know, it's it's only eight forty nine a month or eighty four ninety nine a year. Um, you know, we sit here and, and and I know whoever listens to the podcast enjoys the podcast, but there are certain things you can do in print that you just can't do verbally sure the the detail of the statistics for example and i keep i keep pushing the inside the numbers where you know chris talks about how well individual players are doing but it, it's not just that it's it's some of the other stuff we run where for example we were talking about the uh the game preview and and we can't regurgitate the stats in here on the podcast but if you actually read the written word you know there are things we can do with tables and data that you can't do verbally so um you know uh I, I feel like I've been doing this a long time, and I feel like this is the best content we've ever done on Tech Sideline. We just keep getting better and better 
and better. So sign up, try it out. If you want to just try it out, eight forty nine for a month. If you don't think it's worth it, email me at the end of the month. I'll give you your money back. Eight fifty isn't going to kill me. It's way more valuable to me that you actually try the product. So that's my pitch. There you go. And there's a student price as well. Yes, twenty nine ninety nine for students. There you go. Great time to become a part of the Tech Sideline family, Chris. You know, I always ask you, what's coming up this week on Tech Sideline? Oh man, let's see. Today we got the game preview. It's basketball signing day, so I'm sure Tech will have a press release on that, which we'll just copy. Yeah, it's true. I don't have time to write my own. So uh, <laughs> it's not so much what's coming up, but what ran yesterday. Corey Van Dyke uh, scared up a bunch of old uh, former uh, Tech players. Uh, who, to talk about Bud Foster. Yeah, really phenomenal stuff. stuff. And that yeah. article's free. That so, article's free. Anybody can read that. Yeah, so, uh, so Google Bud Foster and his players' words or just come to the website. Got a big Brandon Patterson piece on the Wake Forest game coming. He'll have an article on Georgia Tech. We'll have an Inside the Numbers article. We'll have a Friday Q&A. I think Jason Stam still has three articles to send this week. So we have a lot of content coming up. So yeah. we need to end this podcast so I can get to work. Let's end this <laughs> podcast. That is a uh, great, great stuff coming up on TechSideline.com. Again, be sure to follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all at Tech Sideline. If you're watching the episode, be sure to like and subscribe. It'd be uh, very like, appreciated. Like, 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 yep. comment too, because that'll yeah. help us get more views. Absolutely. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, breaking down the Georgia Tech Virginia Tech game Monday morning. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it for this edition of the Tech Sideline podcast. Thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks to everybody for the questions. Um, for our for terrific producer behind the scenes, Malcolm Stewart, our managing editor, Chris Coleman, our founder and head of Will Stewart, and I'm your podcast host, Evan Hughes. Thanks so long. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you Monday morning right here on the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by the Fisher Law Firm.